Okay, folks, we're going to get started. I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier chair here at CSIS. I want to welcome you to our new building. Uh, if you haven't been here before, uh, it's uh, the good news is we have a new building. The bad news is we're still working out some of the kinks in terms. So if the acoustics are slightly off or it's a little colder, then we're still adjusting the AC. So just bear with us. And I ask my, my fellow panelists to also do the same. We have a very interesting panel and on the record conversation about the future of the Inter-American Development Bank and the private sector. Uh, we have panelists, uh, who, three of whom are going to be speaking in a personal capacity, and I'll indicate which of the three are speaking in a personal capacity. And then we have my very good friend, uh, Gustavo Arnavat, who is the U.S. Executive Director um, for the Inter-American Development Bank uh, for the United States, uh, the US, for the U.S., and is going to be speaking on behalf of the United States uh, government. Um, but let me just, you have their biographies in front of you, but I also want to indicate we have Dr. Uh, Maria Gonzalez Miranda, who is the Executive Director for Mexico and the Dominican Republic. We have Director uh, Leo Cruz, uh, for the Executive Director for Belgium, China, Germany, Israel, Italy, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. So it's a you know, multiple personality uh, situation. And then we have uh, uh, Kurt M.A. Kisto, who is the Executive Director for the Bahamas, Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, Trinidad, and Tobago as well. But if I'm, if I'm, if I'm correct. So uh, you have their bios in front of you. Uh, the way we're going to run this is I'm going to ask each of the, uh, the speakers to make a formal statement. I'm going to first spend two to three minutes explaining what the heck is the IDB, why are we having this conversation. Then I'm going to ask each of the folks to uh, make a formal statement. And then I'd like each of the panelists to respond. Uh, I may, as the, as the chair, ask a couple questions, on, uh, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A uh, as well. So let me start with what is the Inter-American Development Bank? It was started in 1959. Uh, it's the largest um, uh, development bank uh, in terms of lender to the region. I believe it's larger than the World Bank in terms of its actual lending activities in the region. So it's a very major uh, development player. 50.1 percent of the shares are owned by the borrowers. Uh, the largest individual shareholder is the United States with 30 percent. It was started in the Eisenhower administration, but really got started in a serious way under President Kennedy, and he's remembered fondly at the Inter-American Development Bank. I know there's a statue or there's a bust of, of President Kennedy in the, the main foyer at the Inter-American Development Bank. The main uh, lending line of the main set of lending activities for the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, it lends out about 11 to $12 billion a year in what's called the main part of the Inter-American Development Bank, of which about a billion five is private sector, uh, various sorts of private sector lending activities. From that, from that window, if I'm correct, it's not, they cannot make equity investments out of the main Inter-American Development Bank lending line. So, for, so the first thing you should think about is there's this first set of activities because the main Inter-American Development Bank that has shareholdings and uh, the shareholders and has a specific board. There's separately another thing that's called the Inter-American um, Investment Corporation, the IIC, which is primarily focused on, uh, primarily focused on small and medium-sized enterprises. They can make equity investments, but haven't as of late in the last 10 years or so. Uh, and between sort of their own activities as well as sort of catalyzing other investments is about another billion dollars, if I'm correct, more or less. And then there's something that's very, very special at the Inter-American Development Bank that was started under George H.W. Bush that has been championed by both Republicans and Democrats and then also share held by other countries as well. It's something called the Multilateral Investment Fund, also known as the MIF. And the Multilateral Investment Fund um, it makes, can make equity investments, can make venture capital investments, invest in a variety of investment funds in the region, has also, but is, it's about $200 million a about, year? About 100. about 100 a year in terms of money out the door. Uh, and about 70% are in the form of grants. Uh, my connectivity with them originated about 10 years ago. Uh, they were under Don Terry when he was running the MIF. He was someone who was a big proponent of uh, looking, at, uh, looking at the impact of uh, 
remittances on development. I think he was an early innovator in that particular space. The IDB as a whole was a, an early innovator, I think, and, and thinking of strategically about remittances and so one of the great contributions of the Inter-American Development Bank. There's one other thing. There's something called opportunities for the majority, which is if you go back to sort of, we, let's say there's three buckets. There's the Inter-American Development Bank, there's the IIC, and there's the MIF. Um, in the main set bucket, the Inter-American Development Bank, there's something called opportunities for the majority, which is a relatively small chunk of the private sector activities. It's about 50 or $60 million a year. It's primarily focused on base of the pyramid sets of activities. Um, our thinking here at CSIS was to host a variety of the shareholders as opposed to members of the management and uh, and, the, and these, these executive directors are, as I said, are speaking in their personal capacity, except for Gustavo, who's speaking on behalf of the United States, um, because I, there are rumors that, that the Inter-American Development Bank is at a transition point in thinking about uh, what role, they're certainly thinking about what's the role of, of, of the Inter-American Development Bank in, a, in the context of a, of a region that's had 10 fabulous years. It's really had, my view is, it's had the 10 best years in its history economically. Uh, and you have a variety of, of countries now. You have a, a number of countries that are becoming upper middle income. You have some countries that are very poor like Haiti and Nicaragua, and you have countries that are in between. But if you look at places like Costa Rica and Peru, where I've been to in the last six months, um, these are countries that are inspiring in the kinds of changes that have happened, but I think it creates dilemmas for um, development institutions like the Inter-American Development Bank. At CSIS, we've done two reports, and then I will stop, um, that I think are relevant to this discussion. One is called our Shared Opportunity, uh, which was a bipartisan commission that looked at the role of the private sector in development and looked at how the various sorts of instruments, so I think the conversation or the description I made of the IDB, the main IDB, the IIC, the MIF, the opportunities for, the, the, for uh, the majority, these sorts of various windows or instruments and how they work together or how they work more strategically together is something that the United States is having a conversation about and is a conversation that's going on all around the world and thinking about how do we leverage various instruments in a changed and changing context for development and as we hit sort of a ceiling in, in a period of frankly of austerity where I think you know, my view is the 10-year bull market on official development assistance is over. I don't think we're going to see large increases globally of ODA over the next five years or even the next 10 years. Um, the second report is uh, that something we wrote called Strategic Foreign Assistance Transitions, looking at the role of how should the United States rethink its relationship with middle-income countries. Uh, my view is it's really hard sell in the United States to give traditional chicken or beef foreign aid to countries that have space exploration programs, that have starter uh, bilateral foreign assistance programs of their own, but we need to repurpose our cooperation and trade relationship to have a more sophisticated relationship. We shouldn't be offering chicken or beef foreign aid. We ought to be offering things that look like um, uh, sinking funds or tr re rethought trade relationships, and we looked at five countries in the last 30 years where the United States had exited, such as Portugal or Costa Rica or uh, Croatia and, and one of the Baltic states, and what, what we had left behind, how we'd repurposed our relationship, our reframed our relationship to look more like our relationship with South Korea as opposed to, say, our relationship with Haiti. So um, with that, all that, I'm going to um, stop talking and I'm going to ask uh, Maria, uh, Maria, who is speaking in a personal capacity, who is the executive, who is holds the, the role of executive director for Mexico and the Dominican Republic um, to make a, make a few remarks. Maria, the floor is yours. Just push, push the button. Many thanks, Dan. Uh, thank you so much for, for the opportunity to be here. I'm really glad for the, to have this opportunity to talk to you about this, these issues. Uh, I think the key question here is that we have to ask ourselves is how the multilateral development banks, the IDB in particular, may remain relevant, if not enhance their development role in a world that is already characterized by a very rapid and profound change in the balance of economic and political power at a global level. Uh, and I think to understand how the IDB can transform itself or should transform itself along with other development banks, we need to understand what these changes are about. I think at the risk of sounding a little bit oversimplistic, I think a first one, a first change is, is the one in the balance of the dynamics of economic activity 
between advanced economies, emerging market, and low-income countries. Uh, the last two groups have greater potential output growth, growth for the medium and long term, and as they develop, they are also becoming relatively more integrated to financial markets, gaining much greater access to alternative sources of funding, including at a bilateral level by some of the most buoyant emerging markets that are around, for example, China. What this has implied is that the multilateral development banks have lost some space as a main finance source for both the public and the private sector in the region, in Latin America and the Caribbean, com compared to what used to happen dec decades ago. With this said, I think we should not uh, fool ourselves in thinking that they do not remain a relevant source of funding, especially during low parts of the economic cycle. In Latin America and the Caribbean, those lower income countries with relatively less access to international inter, um, financing flows still uh, have some 50 to 70 percent of their external financing represented by uh, multilateral development banks. In middle income countries like Mexico, uh, multilateral development banks still source some 20 percent of the external debt, even at, some, even at points of uh, high liquidity um, financing around in the in international markets. It is still true, however, that no MDB or the multilateral development banks together would be capable of doing all the very heavy lifting for all the financing that the Latin America and Caribbean region has uh, as a, 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 in terms of needs, including once we add the, the private sector. A second issue is that more and more countries have developed institutionally and politically. And this uh, reflects in the international arena. This is, in no minor part, the result of the change in balance of the economic power. And this means that the type and quality of the relationship between the multilateral development banks and the borrowing countries has to truly turn into one of partnership. If there is going to be buy-in of the reforms and true absorption of the technical advice and cooperation that comes with IDB lending or funding in general. It also means that a new level of responsibility must emerge from member countries of the uh, borrowing, mem borrowing member countries of the multilateral development banks and middle income countries in particular within those uh, institutions. With this, I don't want to be misunderstood in saying that the multilateral development banks are not needed anymore. It's just that we need to get what the situation is about to know where they need to evolve. I think a few things that, uh, just to finish, um, in terms of where should we getting into, in my opinion. Number one, multilateral develop development banks are still incredibly useful to construct the backbone or of structural reforms that continue to be needed if middle-income countries are going to consolidate their development. When dealing with the public sector, multilateral development, development banks provide a great level of additionality in terms of their technical cooperation, a seal of quality, which helps the, governors, the governments in these countries to garner political support for reform. This implies that we need strong MDBs with sufficient technical quality, reputation, and intellectual leadership, and presence to support sound public policy frameworks. And it also means that multilateral development banks need to listen to governments and understand where, it can, where they can and cannot be useful. For middle-income countries, for example, the greater value comes from areas of intervention with multilateral development banks uh, are properly articulating their lending with the government's development plans and respond flexibly to the needs stated by the country authorities. A second point is that MDBs are still an important source of public financing, and even more so at the low part of the economic cycle. In times of high uncertainty in the global financial markets, MDB public financing can still be a critical component of the country's capacity to manage their microfiscal risks appropriately, in a manner that protects economic development and the most vulnerable groups. Because since we cannot forget that middle-income countries are still faced with critical developmental challenges, important intra-country differences like high poverty, inequality, which remain serious problems of, um, in, in most uh, middle-income countries in the world, we do need the multilateral development, development banks to still have a presence in, in our countries. This implies that 
we need MDBs to be sufficiently large and also financially resilient. Until now, much of this resilience had come from the structure of the MDBs in which advanced development partners could support the vagaries of international capital markets and provide backing and support to the development institution roughly at any point in time. But with this being less and less the case, we need to ensure not only that the MDBs have sufficient resources, but also that they are managed in a way that is more suitable to the new realities. In regional development banks in particular, this will require for the middle-income countries to gradually gain greater say and also greater responsibility in building or helping build financial buffers to ensure that global shocks that may impinge in the region in a highly correlated manner will not affect the soundness of the multilateral development bank itself. This also requires start using resources ever more effectively. A third um, point is that when working with the private sector, multilateral development banks are mostly a catalyzer. Certainly, Multilateral development banks like the IDB cannot cover all the development needs for the private sector, nor they should. They need to help countries develop deeper financial markets rather than crowd out private sector actors. In this sense, cooperation with other donors and private sector agents to enter market seg segments that are not being attended due to market failures and the presence of externalities is, is crucial. We should not see these organizations as competitors multilateral development banks do not compete between them, and, and in any case, competition is actually a good thing. They need to become useful partners which can help structure interventions that generate an important demonstration effect or that help repair some market failures, allow, allowing the private sector to flourish. And last uh, but not least, multilateral devel development banks can be a very crucial broker for functional cooperation agreements. They have a comparative advantage helping multiple countries coordinate agendas and resources to development ends. South South cooperation initiatives form an important part of these efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Gustavo, great to have you here. Th thank you, Dan. And let, me, let me start off by thanking uh, CSIS uh, and you in particular, Dan, for organizing this, this panel. Uh, you've been involved in development finance and development uh, activities for at least a decade, if not, not longer. Um, and I know you've been a strong advocate uh, for uh, the U.S. involvement uh, in uh, multilateral organizations. So I want to you know, thank you for your, for your thought leadership in this area. I think what I want to do is just provide a, a brief overview of why the United States is even involved uh, in the IDB, why it's so important to us. Uh, touch a little bit upon the, on the private sector, which I know is a subject that's uh, very important. Um, it's a you know, part of a review that's ongoing now within the IDB, which I think can, can be and should be uh, historic. Um, and then you know, later on, in the questions I can provide you know, further details. But as you mentioned, the bank was established in 1959 by President Eisenhower, um, and then following up very strongly by President Kennedy, really in the, in the context of the Cold War. Uh, we recognized back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, that uh, the region, uh, with all the poverty, the lack of democracy, was very vulnerable to encroachments by the Soviet Union uh, and their allies. And so we need to do something to attack uh, poverty and inequality in a very direct way, which is how we got involved. Uh, happily, we won the Cold War, uh, that is, behind us. Uh, but at the same time, we continue to be very, very interested in what happens in the region. Uh, first, we don't want any rollbacks. We're very proud of how the region has been uh, democratized. And uh, you know, except for one country uh, in the region, uh, my native Cuba, um, it is a region that, by and large, is fairly uh, democratic. Uh, clearly, we have to continue to see what happens in particular countries. But the region, from a political perspective, from an economic perspective, has grown, has evolved, matured tremendously since the, since the bank was founded uh, 50 years ago. And, and the United States uh, is, is, is very uh, dependent on the region. A lot of people don't realize that we export more, the United States exports more to Latin America and the Caribbean than we do to Europe. Uh, three times what we ex export to China, for example, uh, a region that is still developing economically. And so one can only imagine, uh, as the region continues to, to mature economically, how much that will mean for demand for goods and services from the United States. So it's critically important that we be engaged uh, in, in, in the region. Uh, we have shown, uh, at least during the law administration, strong support for the IDB when we advocated for help to structure uh, the capital increase that we got uh, a few years ago, capital increase that doubled the lending capacity of the bank from roughly uh, five to six to seven billion dollars per year 
prior to the global financial crisis that began in 2008 um, to roughly 11 to 12 billion dollars. And I have to tell you that this was, a, this was not an easy thing to do given the, the fiscal environment in which uh, we find ourselves in and continue to, to find ourselves in, uh, trying to convince the Congress that this was a worthy investment. Uh, I think in the end, the investment the United States made and taxpayers made was a very smart one. Um, the, without getting into too much of the details of the capital increase, the, 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 the portion of the paid-in capital that U.S. taxpayers have to, have to uh, invest in is, is roughly $510 million over five years, $102 million per year for five years. And that investment is going to support an additional 50 to $60 billion of additional investments in this region of the world uh, that were so, uh, that, that's so important to us. So I think it was a very smart investment uh, from, uh, in, in terms of its effectiveness, but also its, uh, its, its efficiency. Uh, and uh, you know, we are a very strong supporter of the, of the bank um, and the, the lending that it does. Uh, on occasion, uh, we're accused of not caring enough um, because we might abstain or vote no on a particular project. But over, overwhelmingly, I would say that we uh, support the lending uh, of, the, uh, of, of the bank. Um, so long as the lending uh, is done in a way that promotes uh, strong development effectiveness and impact, and of course, as long as it's being done in a way that's consistent with the policies of the, of the IDB. With respect to the private sector, uh, this for, for the United States is a very important area of programming. Uh, the charter of the IDB uh, provides, authorizes the bank uh, to engage uh, in the private sector. We also do, to, do it, as, as Dan mentioned, through a, a, couple, a, a few other windows, including uh, the MIF um, and the AIC, and also opportunities for the majority. Uh, but the, the, the bulk of it is really, the, the big number is done through the, through the bank. Um, and we, we lend directly to some financial institutions, but otherwise to private companies in the region. Uh, perhaps the signature investment that we've made is the $400 million investment in connection with the Panama Canal expansion, which is so important not only for Panama, but I think it's going to have a uh, huge effect in the United States. Uh, Pres Vice President Biden was in, in Panama recently and talked about the kind of impact that the, uh, that the, um, that the, uh, you know, by the, that the expansion of the canal is going to have on U.S. ports, a very positive uh, uh, impact uh, that, that, that it will have. Um, but the bank, uh, I think, um, I think we, you know, we believe that the bank can do a better job in the way that it's now deploying its capital in the private sector, which is one of the reasons why we're engaged in this review of, of these windows uh, and asking ourselves what's the best way of maximizing development uh, impact. Really, that should be our, our primary focus. And then we can focus later on on scalability, how big it should be, et cetera. But we want to make sure that whatever we're spending in the region, whatever investments we're making, we're doing it in a way that maximizes the development effectiveness of those, uh, of those investments. Um, we, so we, we, we very much uh, welcome the review. Uh, it's a review actually that uh, began over a decade ago and I think we're taking it up again under direct uh, instructions from our, our governors who, uh, who uh, earlier in the year met in, in Panama and decided that instructed the board of executive directors, which is where we sit, uh, to, uh, to study this issue and to give guidance to management and to work with management carefully on coming up with different uh, alternatives. Sorry, Gustavo, you, you guys haven't been looking at it for 10 years ongoing. You, 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 you're, re, you're revisiting it after correct. 10 years, correct? That's right, that's right. Um, and uh, and just, let me just finish by saying that you know, a couple of the ways that we, uh, that we engage in the private sector, we, as I mentioned, we do make direct investments uh, in, in, in companies. But we also work with, on the, with, the, with the public side of the, of, the, of the bank, if you will, working with, with governments in order to ensure an enabling environment so that private business, private enterprise can thrive. So we, we work with, with, the, with the governments to identify bottlenecks, to identify uh, regulatory areas that can be, um, uh, you know, where we can, we can bring our, our, our expertise uh, to ensure that uh, you, can ha you can have efficient capital formation in, in these, gov in these uh, areas, uh, in various countries, uh, that you can have, um, uh, you know, wh whatever uh, legal and regulatory changes can be made in order to provide for more effective uh, security interests, for example, that can be pledged in order to promote, uh, you know, finance uh, in, in the regions, um, better ways of identi identifying property interest. Uh, again, for the purpose of being able to finance uh, transactions and being able to enable sales of, of real and personal property. Those are the kinds of things that we also engage in, that pr promote, promoting capital markets as well, uh, and savings, uh, structural uh, um, tax reforms, et cetera. Anything that really uh, ultimately promotes 
the development uh, locally of, of savings and uh, of capital. Thank you. Thanks, Gustavo. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Kisto to, to, to speak next, please. Thank you, Dan, and very good morning to you all. And that we all have a couple of minutes to say something about the IDB and the risk of repetition, given that we all sit on the same board. I will try to go off my script on what I have prepared to try to add some, some more value to the discussion. I think the, the role of the IDB and the necessity of the IDB has been very well described and articulated thus far. <clears throat> I think I will look at more of the challenges to, to the IDB and challenges to the IDB in dealing with small island development states, particularly my experience from from the Caribbean. <clears throat> a very good starting point would really be to admit that development is dynamic, that development is not a static state of us, could never be a static state of affairs, that development will always be aspirational, and the whole process is really an iterative one, and it's not a state that we can truly say that we have arrived at or we have evolved to. Because if we are really thinking and if we are really innovating and if we are really growing, we should constantly keep pushing what is that glass ceiling or what is the barrier of how we think and conceive development. And I think that could be a starting point in terms of the kinds of processes that we're looking at now in shaping the role for the Inter-American Development Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank within the structure of the international financial architecture. Everything we do is driven by change. Everything we do is driven by focus. Everything we do is driven by um, strategy. One must constantly reorient. One must constantly be cognizant of changing clients' needs. And I think most of the change that is taking place and most of the drivers of this change really is arising from the way multilateral development financing and the way development financing is emerging within, within, the, within the marketplace. The plethora of new actors, especially new countries on a bilateral basis making development financing available, an increasing role of access to capital markets, the role of large transnational firms, and a strong voice and innovative development strategies being employed by the, by, the, uh, by the NGOs sector bring several new challenges to multilateral development banks. And I do believe that this is the context in which the IDB needs to position itself and think about its role and think about its relevance to its member countries in the region. Thinking about small island development states, the constituency with which I represent, as you know, some of the highest indebted countries in the world fall within that category, whereas some strong middle-income countries fall into that category. They are all small economies, they are all vulnerable, they are all open to, um, to external economic shocks but they're all open to shocks from climate change in which all development and all development aspirations can easily be wiped out or can easily, or can easily return to start or return to zero within a day or within two days. These are the kinds of challenges that we must look at and we must, and, and we must pay particular cognizance of. I recently came back from a public-private partnership forum in the Caribbean, and the discussion hinged on, given the high indebted situation in the region and the closure of fiscal space, how do we drive growth? And this growth, everyone, it was the consensus needs to come from and could come from the private sec sector. This in itself defines a role and defines a space of how the IDB can and could react with such countries. Given that the spaces for policy-based lending is closing, 
How do we engage in the discussions that we need to engage in? What is the best role for the IDB within the Caribbean in facilitating PPPs? Is it one of access to finance? Is it one of knowledge? Is it one to ensuring that the best practices of PPPs are applied within the region and adapted to the peculiarities of small island states with respect to scope, with respect to size, and respect to opportunities? How do we lose, use the IDB knowledge and the IDB relationship with these countries to foster the right type of PPP arrangements that would indeed facilitate the kind of private sector led growth, especially when the fiscal space is closing and the government has few opportunities for fueling such type of growth. <clears throat> There's much talk, talk now, as, as was hinted here, on reorganization of the private sector windows of the IDB, with a view to making it more efficient and relevant to the actors in the region. I do believe that the IDB, with its reach in the region, I do believe the IDB, with its knowledge in the region, I do believe the IDB, with its relationship in the region, has tremendous potential to play a catalytic role with the private sector and understanding the government policy framework for private sector growth in the region. This obviously has to be a process that needs to be very well thought out. I do believe the main challenge for the IDB is defining its space. There are many actors, other MDBs, non-state actors, but where does the IDB fit in? Where would it have the most transformational capability? How can it be most catalytic in doing so? And I do believe that that is where we should focus the debate and bring the creative energies of being a multilateral bank, being a bank that has creative institutions like the multilateral investment funds, and building on the strengths not only of the IDB as a bank and, and, and its non-borrowing members, but using the strength and local knowledge and successes that we have had within Latin America itself over the, over the 10 years, seeing borrowers as well as non-borrowers as partners in thinking through the new development agenda and especially one that is private sector led. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Cruz, if you would please. Just push the, you, push, push the button. Thank you, Dan. It's a great honor for me, having been invited to this in Europe and especially in Germany, well known uh, and recognized institution of the highest reputation. I'm deeply, I'm deeply grateful for this invitation. I don't have to refer to the macroeconomic situation of the Latin American countries, because all of you know that the macroeconomic foundations in many countries are, compared to other regions of the world, relatively solid. Of course, we have to recognize that the medium-term outlook is less favorable than in, previous, in the previous decade. But the latest OECD outlook on Latin American economy, 2013, states that the overall perspective, uh, perspectives remain uh, positive. It is nothing new to state that SMEs are of highest relevance for a healthy economy in each and every country. In fact, in a lot of countries, the SMEs are the backbones of the economic success and the wealth of the people. Being a German, uh, allow me a very brief view on the German Mittelstand to illustrate its importance for economic growth in Germany. Germany has about 3.5 million small and mid-sized businesses collectively known as Mittelstand. About 99, 99% of all German companies are SMEs. They contribute as much as, as 52% of total economic output. They are responsible for 37% of the overall turnover of German companies and provide employment for 79 
percent of the labor force. Many SMEs are global players in valuable niches that are largely invisible to the, nevertheless, to the average consumer. Tools, parts, components that are niches that, uh, that are niches that are critical to manufacturing process. The Mittelstand incorporates companies with fewer than 500 employees or less than 550 million annual revenue. And another important factor is that the training provided by the German Mittelstand makes a major contribution towards the comparatively low level of youth unemployment. We have about 7.5%. 7.9%. Uh, in Spain, for example, you have 56% youth unemployment. In overall, 83% of all trainees are trained in the middle span, in the SMEs. So the SMEs form the heart of the country's social market economy and serve as the key engine of growth and employment. I told you this because I wanted to explain the reasons why we in Germany specifically emphasize the SME questions. If you look at Latin America, we find a, a, a couple of similarities, but a lot of difference. SMEs are equally, are equally a fundamental building block of the productive uh, structure in Latin America, accounting for, as we guess, around 99% of the businesses, and employing about, employing about around 67% uh, of the employees in the region. However, in comparison, SMEs in Latin America contribute relatively little to GDP, which reflects their low level of productivity. In addition, levels of international internationalization of SMEs in Latin America are significantly lower than in Europe and in East Asia. While only around 10% of Latin American SMEs engage in export activities, 40% of European SMEs do so. Therefore, to us, the importance to support private enterprises, to support SMEs in Latin America is one of the keys to a sustainable and healthy development of a country and its society. It also contributes considerably to a much better diversification of wealth and access to goods and services. For us, it is of some importance that all four existing private sector windows of IDB should be part of one effective entity. To achieve a maximum development impact, the IDB's public operations and private activities need to be coordinated in a way that a business-friendly and investment-conducive environment is fostered. This kind of quote, coordination approach requires a far closer cooperation of the public and the private sector lending arms of, ID, of the IDB group than it has been practiced under the present institutional setup. Despite the numerous efforts undertaken to overcome the coordination challenges. As you all know, Latin America is a continent of mostly middle income and higher middle income countries. I would not say at the moment that Latin America is awash with liquidity, but generally speaking, Domestic and foreign sources of investment capital are not short in supply. Argentina excluded, which is a special and totally inadmissible case of irresponsibility and misbehavior. Latin America has a well-functioning banking and financial sector that provided to be astonishingly Astoningly, astonishingly, 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 difficult word for me, sorry, uh, 
astonishingly crisis resilient during the past economic and financial turbulences. Particularly, larger companies can tap the national and regional capital markets, including through in the issuance of corporate bonds as an alternative source of financing. Also of some importance is that IDB is not the continent's sole development bank. This leads immediately to the question, what should, against this very briefly outlined background, what should, IDB, should be IDB's private sector look like? What is IDB's role as an investment financier? The IDB is in terms of financial capacity a small institution, a small institution. Even under the scenarios geared at maximizing the non-sovereign guaranteed lending, the, IDB, the IDB's group's lending to the private sector represents only a minimal percentage of Latin America's total private sector investment volume. Not only for this reason, IDB cannot do everything. The bank's resources are to be used for investment expenditures for which alternate, alternative sources of finance are not available. The IDB needs to focus on niches in which it can operate with high development effectiveness, development impact, and most important, as we say, additionality. Therefore, we highly recommend a reality check what IDB can realistically finance with the resources likely to be available. The degree of selectivity is a key factor which level of development effectiveness IDB can achieve. As regard to the funding of the private sector operations, I would like to add that IDB should also focus on leveraging its own financial contributions and acting as a catalyst for co-financing and the crowding in of additional resources. We recognize that equity investment is also a key element in this approach. Let me summarize my remarks in specifying a few priorities for IDB private sector engagement as we, as I personally, uh, see it. First, lending to and, and investing in companies in countries with less developed financial markets. Second, assistance to micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises with no, ex, uh, with no access to commercial loans, at least not at reasonable rates. Thirdly, supporting companies engaged in sectors such, such as public infrastructure and agriculture and activities related to green growth, climate change, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and environmental, and environmental protection. Don't know, fourth. Provision of long-term financing in venture capital if otherwise it is unavailable. Fifth, provision of loans denominated in local currencies, in particular to SMEs. Sixth, fostering financial innovation and the development of domestic financial intermediaries through financial lines. And last, development of a counter-cyclical lending and investment pattern as opposed to the currently prevailing pro-cyclical pro lending pattern. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leo. I very appreciate your going into detail on your view of this. I'm quite appreciative, and I thank all the panelists, but I thank you in particular, Leo, for those very, very thoughtful remarks. But um, I heard a number of things from the panelists. Um, I heard uh, some things about we, the IDB could do a better job. I heard about middle-income countries need a greater say, or uh, borrowing countries need a greater say. Uh, 
Uh, I heard throughout something about what's the role or where its value is. Um, the shorthand in the biz is what's our additionality, which is the fancy term for what's our impact, how are we making, what's our, what's, what's our contribution to this, what makes us special. Um, but then I also think, uh, I thought your comments, Leo, in terms of here are some specific areas that, that in, in particular, um, while, I, while I have you on the panel, can you, how do you pronounce Schadenfreude, by the way, since astonishingly is, was when, when could you, is it Schaud, it's Schadenfreude, right? Everyone in, in American English uses Schadenfreude. Is it Schadenfreude. That's it, Schadenfreude. Thank Schadenfreude. You. Thank you, thank you. I was, I was wondering. So that's I, that bad feeling. You shouldn't have that. No, no, you should never have it. Exactly, but, but the, the, the. What I do think is when, when I think about these, when I think about these, these sort of streams of, of within the comments. I, I let me put to each of you. I thought Leo had a very detailed list. That it, throughout, I heard, we need to pick. We should pick where we can make a difference where we ought to add value, where we can make, and I think Leo named, uh, listed seven. So let me start with each of the panelists, just ask them each, just to, just to reflect on Leo's list of seven, for example. Is this, is this where you would put your, I mean, obviously, we, some folks may not be in a position to say, well, I want to think about this a little bit more, but this is Leo's personal view. But why don't I start with you, Gustavo? You, you're, uh, you've been in the finance uh, business a long time before you got into the development before you got into public service, uh, what's your reaction to Leo's suggestion of, the, of those seven areas? Well, I, my, my answer is I'd like to think about them a little, little more. Uh, but however, his, uh, when I, there's something he said which I think is, is very important. He put in perspective the size of the lending capacity of the IDB, particularly in the, in the private sector context, uh, in the context of all the private sector uh, financing needs of, of Latin America and, and, the, and the supply, if you will, of, of capital that's out there, we provide really a very small amount. Um, and even if we were to double, triple, quadruple, uh, and believe me, we're not going to get anywhere close to that in connection with this private sector view that, uh, that we're, that's undergoing, it's still going to have a very minimal impact you know, overall. That's why we have to be very strategic about how we pick and how we choose when to intervene. And I think Leo uh, put his finger on it, is that you know, we should only intervene where there is some kind of a, a market failure, some imperfection in the private sector that is not making available the capital uh, at, um, at, at, you know, or the, or the, the perceived risk levels uh, are so high uh, that we see a worthy um, activity to engage in, and that's why we want to step in uh, for demonstration effect, or because, like I said, the capital just isn't there otherwise. And that's where we can have the most uh, impact, uh, I think. So, so, Maria, you talked about um, the being a catalyst. I think also a little bit what Gustavo was talking about in terms of being, uh, not supplanting what's already out there. Could you talk, what's your reaction to, to, to Leo's list? I think it's a very comprehensive list. Um, I tend to agree with it. I would not say that expanding the capacity of the IDB to, learn, to, to lend to small and medium enterprises or to micro enterprises is, is something that would be useless. I think one of the characteristics also of lending to SMEs is that, or, or micro and small enterprises is, is that you can actually have a very important impact with just even a few thousand dollars. So really you, you do get to, to develop an important reach when you do the, the expansion of capital um, in, in these institutions. I, with that said, it's also true that the IDB's role, same as in the case of any other multilateral development bank, is not to lend to institutions or to firms that are large and can finance themselves easily, either domestically or international, internationally. So there is a balance to be kept. Um, while we cannot cover everything, I, I also alluded to the, to the fact that there is um, a, a very important task in addressing market failures, uh, segments of the market in which the private sector is not coming in. Uh, part of it is going to be the IDB going on, it, on its own. In some other cases, it's going to come with other development partners. It can be private sector, it can be other multilateral institutions, it can be bilateral funds. Um, each, each case is going to be different, but the truth is 
um, Latin America and the Caribbean in general, and, um, and, and there are many countries in the region which suffer from this. Uh, it, it, it's a place with a very shallow uh, financial sector. We do need to get in in a significant way and be able to demonstrate that certain t types of operation, operations can be done and help articulate this intervention so that others can come later on. So having capacity to do that, I think, is and, 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 enough, um, and enough resources to do it in a way that it becomes clear that that impact is, 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 uh, is there and that others can, can come in after us is, I think, very important. Kurt, you talked about the new actors, the increased access to capital market, markets. You talked about um, the need to understand uh, where to add, to add value. Could you, in, in re relation to your comments and relation to, to Leo's comments as well as uh, the other panelists, would you just like to re respond to that? Do you agree with sort of that? Is that the is that the universe that you would agree to? I could agree in general to. Leo's comments, and I think the real starting point, and is what I, I think I repeated maybe too much in, in, my, in my opening comments, is the challenge for the IDB to define its space and define its role in facilitating private sector-led growth, and what can the IDB bring to the table, and what can it, can it do best. And there's a lot of buzz and a talk about capital. And I want to say that it would be wrong to assume that part of the problem of financing private sector-led growth in Latin America and the Caribbean is capital. I think in many cases and in many instances, if a proper diagnostic is, due, is, is, is done, that capital itself or the availability of capital may not necessarily be the problem. The issues may really be how to leverage capital or how to access capital, or how to make available capital relevant to the financing needs. And many of my colleagues made the point of the large SME sector in Latin America, and we should also recognize and, and talk about the large informal M and SME sector in Latin America. And given, and herein lies an opportunity for the IDB as well for example, given this whole knowledge and working relationship with governments and working on the, on the policy side and guiding the kinds of reforms that would allow the formalization of the informal sector and then supporting that with a kind of financing and um, capital tools. And let me just give an example. I just came back from leading a, a, a private sector mission of the bank to my own country Trinidad and Tobago, where, where we had the highest levels of the private sector executives of the bank represented. And it was very clear that there was no issue of liquidity and there was no issue of capital within the banking system, but that the traditional <laughs> commercial banking system in my country does not have the risk tools, does not have the guarantee tools, does not have the knowledge tools in knowing how to translate the excess liquidity into financing products to stimulate private sector growth and development. When you have traditional private sector lending that is based on, on um, assets to leverage financing, how do you translate that to based on lending for, for cash flow? How do you unleash capital to facilitate lending for innovative thought? We live in a knowledge growth, a knowledge-led economy. Innovation is going to come through knowledge. Where, where are the financing projects, where are the financing products in the region, and this is not a Caribbean problem, I think it's a Latin America and Caribbean problem. And as an example, do we have the necessary financing products to finance ideas, to finance innovation where there is no asset or there's no necessary determined cash flow now. And I think we need to take the debate and we need to take the discussion out of the narrow focus of only capital. But we need to take the debate and discussion of what is the IDB and what are the specific needs that our strengths can meet and where can we be the catalyst 
And any time we limit our thoughts that the issue is one thing or the other, I think that is where we begin to confuse what can be done or cannot be done. And I think very important for multilateral banks in general is the issue of partnership, which was alluded to by many of my colleagues. And if you look at the actors within the, 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 the global market space, the participants in development, if I'm to pick the, the NGO sector only, I think the NGO sector has evolved in the last few years from being uh, advocacy to monitoring and evaluation, but to financiers as well. The mere fact that we live in a world where we now have impact investment fund means there's a whole blurring of what is traditionally the role of a multilateral development bank in financing development and the role of entrepreneurs in financing development. And I think the monopoly of policy and financing policy-led growth both in the public sector and private sector, that monopoly is being diluted from multilateral development banks. And there's a blurring and a merging of that into the private sector and into the NGO sector. So we're really seeing a, 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 a big division of the pie, but without straight lines. It's all blending, it's all merging, and that's why I said let us not look at it as static. The rules are significantly changing. We are living in the development world where the rules are changing. And we're financing for development as we traditionally think of it is not the way it is evolving. And in thinking about the reorganization and the reform of the private sector, just to summarize my, my thoughts, we should not limit it to an issue of capital, and we should understand the role of the various actors. We should understand the impact that the various actors can make. We need to admit the shortcomings from a policy side that is tapping private sector-led growth in Latin America and the Caribbean. I do believe that the IDB, given its long experience on the policy side, understands this well. And we need to be a partner, bringing all this together to really find the spaces within which we can have that catalytic effect for the growth that we see. Thank you. There's a lot of thoughtful people in the room, and I could ask several more questions of the panelists, but I'm looking at a number of folks in the room who I know are at either at IFC or they've, they've worked in philanthropy or they've uh, worked at AID uh, who are in the audience. And I know that as part of sort of this broader conversation, I know maybe we think about comparables like the, the, the nexus of USAID, Trade and Development Agency, OPEC, the Exim Bank in the U.S. context, or we look at in the Dutch context, you have the Dutch aid agency along with uh, the very interesting development finance institution, FMO. Um, you have at the World Bank Group, IFC, which combines both technical assistance, they call it advisory services. Uh, along with equity investments, along with lending and investments in funds in one entity, which was a comment that, that Leo made that perhaps that, you know, at the same time, there's also, we've been having a conversation here at, at CSIS about the fact if money's not the vector, if it's about being a catalyst and it's about networks and knowledge networks and providing expertise, then maybe it's not necessarily the the traditional metric has been well how how much oda are we spending or how much money are we pushing out the door what's our volume in a lot of these development finance institutions and when i at ifc if you were an investment officer you were a bigger deal if you were lending more money as opposed to less or when i was at aid if you had a bigger bilateral aid budget that was more important and better in this new world if what i'm hearing from the various panelists is that well, money may not necessarily, money's important, but it's, just, it's a vector of, of other things. It's about being a catalyst. It's about having knowledge that maybe perhaps, and maybe based on Kurt's comments, maybe it's not just about what's the size of the amounts of money that you're pushing out, though to be financially viable, given the current model of, of a multilateral development bank, you need a certain amount of money that you're lending out every year to kind of to keep the lights on and, and pay everybody. 
But why don't we open it up to, to folks, and I'm very happy to call on people. I know that, uh, but I, so I'm, I'm hoping that some of the folks who I'm, I'm hoping are gonna speak will speak. Uh, so uh, why don't we open it up and let's see what, what hands come up. Otherwise, I'll start calling on people. Okay, my friend in the front row here. And we'll do this World Bank style. We'll collect two or three questions. If you can identify yourself and then just in the form of a state, brief statement or a question. Okay, uh, my name is Peter Cleaved. I uh, have worked with the Inter-American Development Bank as a consultant for the MIF uh, and also uh, as a foundation official with the VENA and the Ford Foundation. Uh, worked uh, in m many of the main objectives. Now, what I've heard on the panel is, again, again, beginning with the idea that the money is not the primary resource the IBD has, uh, I heard what the attributes that you do have uh, would have to be mobilized. Uh, one of them is the uh, lower hur hurler rate, hurdle rate, use, a, uh, use money to lower the hurdle rate, to reduce the risk in a certain investment for the private sector. Uh, legitimize an investment because of your presence and your reputation. Uh, provide monitoring and evaluation support because of your network of offices. Uh, and then use your links with government better than the private sector in many cases to improve financial markets and uh, regulations and financial institutions. Then on the other side, I hear the goals of the, of the, of the donors. One, um, SMEs, support SMEs. Employment, close the income inequality work on climate control, strengthen civil society, debt relief, fortify links with the uh, dynamic markets, China and India, and also continue lending. Knowing institutions, there's the momentum factor. To what degree really is there a possibility of making significant changes when you have uh, a, a lot of interest in maintaining each of the activities that are current present? Does the, do the donors have enough ability to work among themselves to really set out what the real priorities of the organization should be. And second, can you get the institution actually to abide by it when they all want to do their own things they've been doing all along? Thank you, Peter. Um, one, other, one or two other questions or comments, I'll take one more. Uh, if not, we, I think Peter, that, that, it, uh, this gentleman here. Thanks. Um, my name is Andrew Yu. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm lead counsel, uh, Deutsche Bank for uh, Latin America and, Carib and the Caribbean. Uh, just to give a, uh, I guess, a perspective, uh, um, I guess, a, a private sector perspective. Um, I, I know that uh, I, the IDB has been, um, and, and, ju and just to um, take further the, this uh, idea of partnership um, between public and private sector, and, and also um, uh, what Dr. Kreutz and Mr. Arnavat uh, mentioned about um, that IDB could be um, very useful to fill in gaps where there is a, a market failure, for example. Uh, you know, there's, there's possibly been a, a long history between um, the IDB and the private sector uh, in, in financing, for example, in terms of uh, the A and the B loans. Um, and I've certainly seen a, a lot of transactions where um, uh, is the IDB and, and other, uh, is it, uh, other say, private sector um, branches of, say, the World Bank have acted together with um, multilaterals um, in partnership. Um, I, I've seen recently, though, um, you know, following the financial crisis, um, many more um, impediments placed on activities of banks, primarily um, in terms of, say, bank regulatory capital um, and, say, leverage ratios, which is, which is really um, put a, I'd say a break on activities of um, banks such as Deutsche and, um, and other investment banks in, in terms of making loans um, into Latin America. I, I would imagine that um, in these situations, um, the ability of institutions such as IDB and the IFC to partner with um, the, so the global investment banks would be um, very welcome. And I, I'm just wondering if there has been, uh, if you've seen much dialogue um, between uh, the IDB and, and private sector, and the private sector, uh, there's been an increase in the dialogue um, since, the, since the financial crisis. So one question on political willingness of shareholders to make some sort of change, and thank you, Peter, for that question. I was thinking that myself. And then I think the other question is sort of the changing, 
global financial environment. I also think of things like Basel III, sort of the changes in regulation that have made less financial capital available, as well as, frankly, in this country, Dodd-Frank, to some extent, has impacted things like SME lending uh, capital funds that are available in places like Africa and Latin America that do have sort of maybe perhaps not unintended consequences, but perhaps as part of this financial regulatory, changed financial regulatory environment, there is less capital, and so perhaps it increases the role for organizations like, whether it's the African Development Bank and the African context, I've certainly seen that where there's been less money available from money center banks in Europe for fi uh, infrastructure financing in Africa, and there's a lot more opportunity they're going to IFC or they're going to the African Development Bank. So why don't we have each of you all would just respond to each of those questions, and if we do it economically, we'll take one or two more questions uh, from the group. So I'll start with you, Gustavo. Sure thing. Um, uh, Peter's question. I, I agree, you know, change management is, is difficult, particularly for an organization that's been around for over 50 years, as large as it is. Um, but we have a few things, I think, going uh, in our favor. One, uh, in connection with the, uh, with the capital increase, it wasn't just a, um, an agreement that we had in uh, on, on an increase in the capital of the, of the institution, but also about important reforms and important priorities. So this was an opportunity for the shareholders to come together and identify what kind of a bank do we want to be, how do we want, what are our modalities, how do we want to do what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And among those was a recognition that we needed to invest more money uh, in the small and vulnerable economies in the region, and also a greater priority uh, for clean energy and renewable energy. And so for example, beginning in 2015, 25% of our projects uh, have to be in clean and renewable energy, and also you know, climate change mitigation. That was an important priority identified uh, by the United States work, work, you know, working with other, other shareholders. Um, the other thing is that, uh, well, actually a couple of other things I want to, want to mention, um, is that um, we, I think all the shareholders recognize that we have to do a better job when it comes to the, uh, the, how we're deploying our capital in the private sector. So there's a recognition of that. I don't think we have to convince too many people of that. Uh, and how we get there, of course, is, is subject to a conversation we're currently having. I don't know where we're going to end up. Uh, it is going to be a multi-year uh, initiative, and so I think we have to be patient. We have to work, I think, all of us very hard in good faith to try to improve the operations of the bank and the private sector. But I think we're very much committed to doing that. And the last thing I want to mention uh, is something that uh, Angelis touched on, which is the issue of, of relevance. Um, one of the things that I'm particularly proud of is this is a bank, because it is owned, uh, because the majority of the owners are borrowing countries, uh, they have, and they have the greatest you know, stake in the bank, they are the ones who are using the, the capital, um, and uh, at least under the current management, you know, I give them a lot of kudos for I think working very closely with the various you know, countries, identify the needs, uh, clearly identify what the capacity is of the bank to meet those needs, but really trying to do the best they can to, re to remain relevant. And as I travel through the region, that's one of the things I hear the most about the current management and how the relevance today is greater than I think you know it's ever it's ever been. And, and one of the ways, something like you know, Kurt uh, mentioned, is how we're working with the social entrepreneurs. And this is, I think, again, a, a lot of kudos to the leadership of the, of the bank that really focuses on this particular area, uh, which I think it can have a lot of impact, uh, you know, going forward. Okay, we'll just go down the, the line here. Leo, why don't you respond to those comments as well, and we'll ask Maria and Kurt. <clears throat> Thanks, Dan. Uh, I think the a bit, bit general answer to the different questions is uh, to state, I think, that private sector activities of a development institution are not valuable as such. My, some people might think so, but I don't, I don't think so. They are valuable and they are important uh, uh, because they, these activities are used to initiate developing processes. So the private sector activities, whatever that might be, of a development institution like IDB, must have a development effect. Uh, the private sector, I always say, is not the golden calf where we dance around, you know, and uh, praise it for it being a golden calf. Uh, but 
uh, uh, we, we, we need the private sector engagement uh, to have certain purposes. Uh, secondly, I would say uh, what I mentioned already briefly in my statement, um, uh, the bank cannot, cannot be, will, will not be, cannot be uh, a competitor to the commercial banks, to the commercial sector, to the commercial lending uh, institutions. That role is, for certain reasons, impossible to, to play for the IDB because the IDB is much too small, as I said, and IDB uh, uh, has not the capacity and uh, uh, cannot really and should not compete. But IDB should use the commercial sector. The, 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 for example, supporting SMEs, you, you, you cannot do directly, of course. You need the commercial banks. But the commercial banks don't do that very often because they need a security. So you have to, to establish incentives. You have to establish uh, uh, what the bank is doing already, uh, but to, have, to do that more in, extensively to, to, to give co uh, guarantees to commercial banks, credit lines, so they can make use of them, then giving that out to to, to the SMEs, for example. And sec uh, there are many other aspects, but for example, the training, it was mentioned by Kurt, I think, and by Maria, uh, and by one of you people. Uh, uh, the training, uh, not everybody, not every SME is a valuable SME. Uh, 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 a guy who is around the corner, uh, uh, grilling bratwurst uh, might be of some valuable for the consumers, but not really valuable as being productive. A, he or she can develop, can develop if he or she gets training, if he or she gets access to a limited, to a responsible amount of, of, of credit. Uh, uh, but again, this has to be thought out. And that best has to be done by, let's say, commercial banks, which uh, are close to the people, which know the situation, in particular, the local situation. So, uh, and that needs, again, training. Training for the people in the commercial banks who are, who are, who are selected or who are identified to do this job. But again, the, you cannot expect from a commercial bank to, to, to take this cost, you know, to take this risk. That needs to be secured, for example, by, by a credit line or by a grant or what have you uh, of, of, of a bank like IDB. So not being competitor, but uh, using the commercial uh, banks uh, uh, as intermediaries to reach these development, developmental relevant uh, um, aims. Thank you. Maria. Many thanks. Um, okay, one, one thing I would like to say is that there is a difference between saying that the IDB or any multilateral in general, because, or, or even a, develop, not a domestic development bank Need, needs to add a, act as a catalyzer of resources and saying that the scale at which it operates doesn't matter. I think those are two different things and are complementary because right now I think the discussion kind of switched into saying, well, you know, if you're a catalyzer, it doesn't really mean matter what size you are, at, at the magnitude of your operations. And I, I, I do think both are complementary, are not competing. You can do more catalyzing with more resources. You can do more operations in more countries at the same time or touch on different segments that are not being attended to. So one thing is not against the other. And I don't believe that anybody, anybody's pretending that any multilateral development bank should go and cover all the needs that are there in the region because that's, imp I mean, it's impossible. Not all the multilateral development banks together can do it. But I think there is a balance. It, uh, there is another element too, which is,
when you're trying, like we're trying now, because um, when you're thinking of um, strengthening the role that you have on how you interact with the private sector, and you try to switch instruments, or not to switch, but to widen the, the, the number of instruments that you have available, and you try to do, for example, more equity, that also has a financial um, aspect of it, that side that you need to, to think of, because you are also talking about a financial institution, which is the multilateral development bank, which is going to engage in different type of operations. It's not the same thing in terms of capital requirements to make a loan and to make an equity investment. So if you're trying to be um, engaged into new ways of interacting with the private sector, and that also entails doing more equity, which is something that, for example, we are talking about right now at the IDB, that also has a minimum requirement of what you have in terms of equity in your balance sheet as an institution. So, and, and there is a minimum that you need to show that you can actually do those operations to have the impact, to have the, 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 the reach um, and, and to make it, um, and to make it uh, sustainable financially for the institution itself, because you have to think of the two things, right? So I, I just wanted to mention that because I think it, we need to provide perspective. It's not, it's, 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 it's true that serving as a catalyzer is important. I think that's the role of the development institutions, but thinking that you can do that with nothing it would also be a little bit of far reach. Um, regarding the political aspect of it, I think um, I think in general there is quite a bit of consensus at the at the IDB in particular that we need to do the most we can with the resources and that there is some focus that has to be had and, and, and that there is some need for a strategic and medium term planning in terms of where we want to get. With that said, I think one of the comparative advantage, and, and, and here I'm going to go back to the public sector aspect, because the fact that we are um, expanding or strengthening our activities on the private sector doesn't mean that we're abandoning the public sector role. And one, and one thing that is important, and, and, and I, I alluded a little bit to this when I, when I did my first statement, is that the more we deal with middle-income countries that have better institutional frameworks and better policy frameworks, the best way to engage for the, by, uh, with the public sector for this kind of development banks is to engage with, um, articulate themselves with the public uh, sector um, national development plans. I mean, you do have a policy framework that is dictated by the government, and then the IDB comes and has a very good dialogue. It has, in, in my opinion, the comparative advantage of the IDB is that it knows how to insert itself flexibly in those, uh, in those uh, po programs that the governments are having. So that requires focus, but it also requires some flexibility and some capacity to adapt to whatever these governments are starting to need and the region is changing and is developing different needs. And that, in, that, in that case, the bank also needs to learn to, to evolve and to be able to respond to those needs. So that's Kurt. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I will start with um, Peter and, and I will start simply by saying necessity drives change. And from what was said, if you look at uh, the, the variety of countries within Latin America and the Caribbean, which are members of the Inter-American Development Bank, you have heavily indebted countries or countries who cannot borrow anymore or countries who have no access to capital markets with very little space to absorb any more public sector financing. You have larger countries, middle-income countries, who have access to international capital markets. So governments can access high levels of financing for public expenditure. And you have large bilateral arrangements for financing of public sector projects and in infrastructure works. So I think by necessity, the IDB 
in dealing with the challenges, both of the needs of its membership and for the role that it can continue to play to maintain relevance, necessitates a need towards moving towards enhancing its engagement with the private sector and enhancing the way it deals with and its capacity to manage the private sector needs in the region. So I think necessity, given the drivers of change and the political consensus and willingness that exists, will lead the transformation. But as you said, in any bureaucratic organization, change, change management, and transformation is indeed a process, and it takes focus to, to manage that. But I remain fairly optimistic that there is a will, there is the, the, the organizational will, there is the political will, and I think the driver is really the necessities that exist from both the client point of view and from both the bank remaining relevant point of view. I, I, I accept that, that um, in terms of uh, access to finance, I think that Basel Tree and Dot Frank has, has, um, has uh, shrunk some of the availability to, to, to doing business with a traditional sector for which finance has been available. And again, this with, with the improved need for financial governance, both in the commercial banking sector and in the multilateral development banking sec sector, forces, forces an institution like the American Development Bank to start to think deeper into partnerships, to start to think deeper into engaging with and dealing with new and emerging actors. To really summarize what I think is the role of the IDB, it is to leverage its knowledge, it is to leverage its relationship, and to echo uh, Maria, they must also have the necessary and optimum level of financial capital. If, they, if, if the bank is to leverage its high capital of knowledge and its high relationship capital, it must have that sufficient and necessary and optimal level of financial capital to have a truly transformative role in development in Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you. Well, I think we'll have to leave it at that. Thank you all, and please join me in, th in thanking the panel.